Welcome to Transformed by Grace, an in-depth Bible study of God's Word, presented by the Berean Bible Society. Join us each time on this station as Pastor Kevin brings the transforming message of God's grace revealed through the Holy Scriptures. Van Morris tells the following story. Two old friends met one day after many years. One attended college and now was very successful. The other had not attended college, never had much ambition, yet he seemed to be doing very well for himself. Curious as to why, the college graduate asked his friend, how has everything been going with you? The less educated, less ambitious man replied, well, one day I opened my Bible at random and dropped my finger on a page. The word under my finger was oil. So I invested in oil and boy did the oil wells gush. Then I tried the same method again, and my finger stopped on the word gold. So I invested in gold, and those mines really produced. And now I'm as rich as Rockefeller. The successful friend was so impressed that he rushed to his hotel, grabbed a Gideon Bible, flipped it open, dropped his finger on a page. When he opened his eyes, he saw that his fingers rested on the words, chapter 11. Sadly, people actually do use God's Word this way, and people actually make life decisions in this manner. It's like the true story of a young lady who told the story of her call to missionary work. After praying a long time for guidance, she opened her Bible at random one day to see if she might find a verse which would indicate the will of the Lord for her life. As her Bible fell open, her eye fell upon Matthew 10, 5 to 6, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. She related that as she read those words, she realized immediately that she was to be a Jewish missionary. Now, no doubt the Lord used this young lady in her work for him, but to misuse God's word in such a manner is not honoring to God. God's word should never be used in a superstitious manner. Verses and truths and promises from God's Word have a context and should be read, studied, interpreted, and applied in light of their context, and importantly, in light of the program under which they are found. Thomas Guthrie writes this, The Bible is an armory of heavenly weapons, a laboratory of infallible medicines, a mine of exhaustless wealth. It is a guidebook for every road, a chart for every sea, a bomb for every wound. Rob us of our Bible, and our sky has lost its sun. We each have an individual responsibility to know God's Word for ourselves. Never take my word for it during these messages. Anytime we hear God's Word taught, we need to check it for ourselves to make sure it's right. We are each called to be like the Bereans in Acts chapter 17, verse 11, which reads, These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, and that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. This is why this ministry is called the Berean Bible Society, because we stand on this principle of the spirit of the Bereans, that each believer needs to search the scriptures for themselves to understand it and to know it and to grow in the truth. Nothing could be more vitally important than to read, study, and understand your Bible. And the Bible is meant to be understood, and God wants us to understand it. Paul prayed for believers that God would enlighten the eyes of their understanding, we read in Ephesians 1.18, and that they would attain to the full assurance of understanding, we read in Colossians chapter 2, verse 2. But in order for us to gain the full assurance of understanding of the Bible, it must be read, studied, interpreted, learned, and applied in the right manner. The Bible is by far the best-selling book in the world today. It's by far the best-selling book every year. No other book even comes close year in and year out. The sales of the Bible aren't recorded in weekly bestseller lists. And it's been said that if it was, it would be a very rare week when any other book would surpass it. 
Uh, taking into account the dozens of English translations, the over 2,000 translations of the Bible in other languages, world sales of the Bible are more than 100 million every year. It is the number one best-selling book in all of history. Estimates are that at least six billion Bibles have been printed, sold, and distributed since the year 1815. Now you would think that with this many Bibles in the world today, that more would know Christ is their personal Savior and that there would be a united stand for the truth of the gospel. There are many reasons why. But the key reason why there is confusion about salvation and in the church as a whole and division about the interpretation of the Bible is because of a failure in the church to rightly divide God's Word. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The Greek word for the phrase rightly dividing here is orthotomeo. It means simply to cut straight. And in reference to God's word, it means to cut straight so as to rightly divide truths on one side from truths on the other. One of the sharpest and clearest divisions in scripture is between law and grace. On one side of this division under law in the past, it was required and would have been wrong to fail to bring animal sacrifices for sin. While on the other side, today under grace, it would be wrong to bring them. So this is rightly dividing, and everybody actually rightly divides when you consider that example. And as we seek to rightly divide, we find that the most important division in Scripture is not between the Old Testament and the New Testament, but rather between God's prophecy program and God's mystery program for today. This simply means that there is a difference between God's dealings with the nation Israel, who had an earthly hope and calling, and God's dealings with the church, the body of Christ, who have a heavenly hope and calling. God has established cuts in His Word, and it's important for us to honor and recognize these divisions in our understanding of the Bible. Consider these things, for example. Exodus 31.15 says that people who break the Sabbath day should be killed. Leviticus 11.7 and 8 says it's wrong to eat ham. Leviticus 4.27 and 28 says people should offer animal sacrifices when they commit sin. Mark 16 verses 17 and 18 says believers can speak in tongues, handle poisonous snakes, drink poison and not die, and they can heal the sick. Matthew 10 verses 5 and 6 says Christians should only preach to Jews. Acts 2.38 says the Holy Spirit is received by water baptism. Acts 2.44 and 45 says Christians should sell their property and have everything common. 1 John 1.9 says you must confess your sins to receive the forgiveness of sins. Any Bible teacher could come along and require their hearers to obey these words. After all, it is the Word of God, and the Word of God is our authority. What we learn by this is that Bible teachers can be biblically correct, but dispensationally wrong. In other words, you can rightly divide the Word of Truth, and you can wrongly divide it as well. You can wrongly try to apply truths and promises meant for another time and another people. There are truths in God's Word intended for our direct obedience, and there are truths not intended for our direct obedience. We understand that very basically with Noah. When God commanded Noah to build the ark, we know that this is not something that we are required to obey today, but it is a very good thing that Noah did. Some promises, instruction, and commands are not for us in the Bible. It's been rightly said that every promise in God's Word is true, but not every promise is meant for you. We must rightly divide the Word to properly understand it. The Bible says what it means, and it means what it says, to whom it was written. And we need to rightly divide the Word to know and understand what's written to us directly. Rightly dividing the word does not mean that we reject part of the Bible or that we pick and we choose what we like or we dislike. 
It means to understand Scripture in light of its context and in light of who it was written to. It means to recognize that all the Bible is for us. It's all for our learning and for our profit and for our edification. But the Bible is not all written directly to us or about us. Some parts of the Bible God addressed to someone else, the nation of Israel, and others he wrote specifically to us, the Gentiles or the nations, under grace. There are principles, truths, examples, and lessons to be learned and applied throughout all of Scripture, but it's not all written specifically to us or for us to live by. The Bible is like mail that God addressed to the people he was speaking to at any given time. And rightly dividing the word simply means to check the address. As an example of this, James chapter 1, verse 1 says, James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Now is this you? And the answer is no. The book of James was written to Israel in the past to the Jews who had been dispersed from Jerusalem and Israel as a result of the persecution in that day. And it also pertains to his plans for future scattered Israel after the church is caught away to heaven at the rapture. And in that day, in the tribulation period, Israel is going to be scattered all over the world by the Antichrist and his persecution. But the book of James is for our learning and our profit. And like many truths from other dispensations, it has principles which are horizontal and are true at all times and true across the dispensations. And in the book of James, we find that. For example, chapter 1, verse 3 says, The trying of your faith worketh patience. Chapter 3, verse 6, it says, The tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. James says, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Now, these things are true for all, and at any time they are horizontal truths. But James is not addressed to us. And James has vertical truths, which are just true for that program and for Israel and are not for us today. And here's some examples of that in this book. Chapter 5, verse 15 says, The prayer of faith shall save the sick. Chapter 1, verse 5 says, Ask of God, and it shall be given him. Chapter 2, verse 24 says, By works a man is justified, and not by faith only. Those things are for Israel under their kingdom, law, faith plus works program. And they're going to be true for Israel in the tribulation and in the millennial kingdom. We'll be returning to the program in just a minute. But first, we'd like to take this time to thank you, our partners, for making these programs possible. If you would like to access our library of helpful Bible study tools, go to BereanBibleSociety.org. Things That Differ, The Fundamentals of Dispensationalism is a paperback 290-page book written by Pastor Cornelius R. Stamm. Those who struggle with rightly dividing the word of truth will find this volume most helpful. Pastor Stem gives the readers an in-depth look at the major differences between prophecy and the mystery. Every believer should read this work. This book, more than any other, has been used to bring people to an understanding of the distinctive ministry of the Apostle Paul. To order your copy, contact the Berean Bible Society for pricing and availability at 262-255-4750. To receive our free full-color 32-page monthly magazine, The Berean Searchlight, call 262-255-4750 or subscribe online at www.bereanbiblesociety.org. Thank you again for your generous gifts. And now, back to the teaching with Pastor Kevin. But when we turn to the epistles of Paul, Paul tells us, I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles. And when Paul is writing or teaching in God's word, he's teaching not Israel under the law, but instead the Gentiles or the nations under grace. And that's us. 
The key to understanding Scripture is to recognize that the letters of Paul are our mail and that they provide the church, the body of Christ of today, with our direct marching orders that we are to live by in this present age of grace. Paul's epistles are our writings to be fully lived by and applied by the church, the body of Christ, in this present dispensation of grace. C.I.S. Cofield rightly said, In Paul's writings alone we find the doctrine, position, walk, and destiny of the church. The truth of salvation by grace through faith alone comes from the writings of Paul. In contrast to James, Paul says, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness, as Paul says in Romans chapter 4, verse 5. Paul says salvation is by faith alone today, not by faith plus works, as James says. Bible teachers do some interesting gymnastics with interpreting what James says with what Paul says, such as uh, you'll often hear the explanation that James is talking about justification before man, and Paul is talking about justification before God. But you don't need to do gymnastics with those two passages when you rightly divide the word of truth. You just allow both to say what they mean and mean what they say to whom they are writing. For Israel and salvation under God's dealings with them under the law, that was absolutely true by works. A man is justified and not by faith only. For Israel, they had works to perform and they had to keep the law. And they had to do all those things and do them by faith. But for the body of Christ and salvation under God's dealings with us under grace, it is to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. For salvation, we just trust that Christ died for our sins and rose again, and we do absolutely nothing. We don't lift a finger Salvation is not of works, lest any man should boast. Salvation by grace through faith alone and Christ's finished work comes from Paul's writings. But this carries over also to truth directly applicable for our walk, position, and future hope. That all of this, too, comes from Paul's letters for us today. Paul's writings are written directly to us, the nations, in this dispensation of the grace of God. And then with this basis of understanding, then we go to the rest of Scripture, we take the literal interpretation of it, and we interpret it in light of the teaching in the epistles of Paul. And then we can draw application and principles from all of the Bible and apply them to our life as they coincide with Paul's writings and teachings for today. A man once asked his wife what she'd like for her birthday, and she replied, I'd love to be six again. On the morning of her birthday, he got her up bright and early, and off they went to a local theme park, and what a day they had together. He put her on every ride in the park, the death slide, the screaming loop, the wall of fear, everything there was in the park. Five hours later, she staggered out of the theme park, her head reeling and her stomach upside down. Right to a McDonald's they went where her husband ordered her a Big Mac with extra fries and a large chocolate shake. Then it was off to a movie, the latest Star Wars epic, and hot dogs, popcorn, Pepsi, and M&Ms. It was an adventure. Finally, she wobbled home with her husband and collapsed into bed. He leaned over and lovingly asked her, Well, dear, what was it like being six again? And when I opened and she said, I meant my dress size. Not exactly what she had in mind that day. And When it comes to God's word, many misunderstand what God has in mind for us too. And often it's because of tradition or it's philosophy or many read preconceived ideas into Scripture. Many spiritualize what's clearly taught and said, but mainly because God's Word is not rightly divided, that it is often misinterpreted and misunderstood. 1 Corinthians 14.37 says, If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, 
Let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Many have the idea that when Christ ascended off the Mount of Olives to heaven, that he stopped speaking. But nothing could be farther from the truth. You need to keep following the revelation of Scripture and not stop short with the end of Christ's earthly ministry or the Holy Spirit's coming on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2. There were new and different things revealed by Christ after his ascension to heaven and after the day of Pentecost. Paul says that the things he wrote to the Corinthians and to the body of Christ, he says here, were the commandments of the Lord. He says something very similar in his epistle to the Thessalonians where he says, For ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. After Christ ascended to heaven and after the day of Pentecost, Israel continued in her rebellion, rejected the Holy Spirit's ministry, and Israel was then temporarily set aside by God. And God raised up a new apostle, gave Paul a message which had never before been revealed, and Christ spoke again. He spoke again from heaven to deliver to the Apostle Paul a new revelation concerning his heavenly ministry to the church, the body of Christ. And to Paul was given the commands of Christ for the body of Christ today. In Paul's epistles, we have the will of God for our Christian lives during the dispensation of grace. In Paul's letters, we find the doctrines of grace that the church is built upon and is to live by and is to share with the world. Now notice that Paul's words as revealed to him by the Lord Jesus Christ are spoken of as commandments. Now, commandments is not a take it or leave it kind of word. When a commandment is given, God expects us to obey and conform our wills to His will. In past dispensations, other commands were given, which were valid at the time given, but are not for today and are not for our obedience. Take food, for example, a topic which is close to my heart. The Bible commands man at the beginning to eat only vegetables and fruit. Later, it allows for eating meat with fruit and vegetables. Then it commands only certain foods to be eaten. Then it commands that all food can be eaten. Now, it is impossible to obey all of those different commands at the same time. And there are other issues in Scripture like this, chief among them, and how a person is to be saved. So it's imperative to determine which commands God would have us obey today and right now. And the answer is that Paul's letters are our writings for today. They are the commands of Christ which are valid for today under grace. The commands of Christ given to and through the Apostle Paul are what we must obey today. And Paul in his writing says we can eat all things, which is a wonderful benefit to being under grace. While there is nothing wrong with red letter editions of the Bible, is there beneficial for seeing when our Lord spoke during his earthly ministry. Many often get the impression, though, that the words in red in the Bible are the most important. Now, they are the words of Christ, and they are important. They are the words of God, our Savior, and to minimize the importance of the Gospels is wrong. That is our Savior, and there is so much there we learn about our Savior and his care and compassion and kindness and love. We see his deity, his humanity, and his majesty through his life. We see his sacrificial death and resurrection. But those words in his earthly ministry are the commands of Christ to the nation of Israel regarding his kingdom of heaven on earth and in preparing Israel to go through the coming tribulation period. Neither of those things apply to us, the body of Christ. We will not go through one second of the tribulation, not any of it. We will be delivered from it by the rapture. And our hope is heaven above, not the kingdom on the earth. The kingdom on the earth is Israel's hope. The Gospels are words uttered to a different people under a different program with a different gospel and a different hope living under a completely different rule of life. Later from heaven, after Israel's fall and setting aside, 
Christ spoke again to and through the Apostle Paul, and he made Paul his mouthpiece to reveal his new message to the world and how Christ is carrying out a heavenly ministry today as the head of the church, the body of Christ, and that he is the God of all grace in giving all men an opportunity to be saved by grace through faith. Paul is God's divinely ordained spokesman, and in his letters we find the very words of Christ to us. And in that being the case, all of Paul's epistles should be read letter edition because they are the words, the very mind, will, heart, and commands of Christ for His church, the body of Christ. They are our instruction from Christ Himself for us today. The earthly ministry of Christ to Israel and the heavenly ministry of Christ to the body of Christ, they are of equal importance, but they are not the same. And if we desire to walk well-pleasing to the Lord in this current dispensation of grace, we must follow the heavenly ministry of Christ and the instructions of Christ found in the letters of Paul. God's word from the resurrected, glorified, ascended, exalted Christ revealed through the Apostle Paul is our authority to live by for today. And to submit to the authority of Christ over our life for today is to submit to the commandments of Christ as revealed through the Apostle Paul. Paul's letters are Christ's manual of grace for how he would have his church believe and behave today under grace. Understanding this is key to understanding your Bible. There's a story about a teenage boy who was deeply interested in scientific subjects, especially astronomy. So his father bought him a very expensive telescope. Since the young man had studied the principles of optics, he found the instrument to be most intriguing. He took it apart, examined the lenses, and made detailed calculations on the distance of its point of focus. The youth became so absorbed in gaining a technical knowledge of the telescope itself that he never got around to looking at the stars. He knew a lot about that fine instrument, but he missed seeing the wonders of the heavens. As believers, just to know all the facts and figures contained in the Bible is not the end for which God has given us this book. The purpose is that we might see the wonders of God's grace, that we might see Christ and know Him and grow in Him and be like Him and follow Him. Thank you again for tuning in to Transformed by Grace. We appreciate your prayer support and the financial gifts. The purpose and mission of the Berean Bible Society is to help you understand the whole counsel of the Word of God. For more information, visit our website at www.bereanbiblesociety.org or give us a call at 262-255-4750. Or if you prefer, write us at the Berean Bible Society, P.O. Box 756, Germantown, Wisconsin, 53022. Now until next time, may you be transformed by God's grace.